It's a great joy today to have an interview with Father Martin McNamara, a great expert on the Bible, especially the Aramaic Bible, and also the Bible in medieval Ireland. So Father McNamara, how did you first get interested in the Bible way back? Well, I suppose it was a general thing that early Ireland was noted for its schools in which the Bible was central. And uh, the English used to come along to the schools, they got free education, they used to move on from one group to another, the Bible and Bead, and that's where it tested. Then I asked myself the question, if they were so well up in the Bible, what did they teach and what have they written? And when I sat looking into that, I found they had very little written. Just two things. They had the Adoran, it's a mystic, a mystic interpretation of the, the, uh, the genealogy of Christ. They had a good one, the, many believe the, the marvels of scripture, but apart from that there was nothing. And the authorities of medieval writing would have to admit the same. So that stayed with me. Then I did theology in Rome at the Greg, and then after that I did the Bible studies at the Biblical Institute. The Bible in the Institute are more intimate, it's an audio authority school. And I remember I had two, I had the interest in theology from Stanislas Leone, because he thought that one text from the uh, Bible would solve a problem in Second Corinthians, the Lord is the Spirit. And he was quite taken with the Targums. He thought the answer was in the Targums. And uh, he, uh, I took him then as a director, I'm a very friendly person anyhow. And I remember in, uh, that when I had finished my licentiate, I was chatting to an American Jesuit, Francis McCool. And I said, now, he was saying, you want to go into the doctorate? Yes. What's your subject? Well, I said, now I have two subjects. He studied with Father Leone, there's the Targums. And then my chief subject is that I'd like to devote my life to, is the Bible in the early Irish church. And he said, I advise you to stay for the moment with Judaica. And you can go back to the, by the by the Irish Bible later, which I did. So I went along, prepared a thesis, and uh, this is emerged as this, the New Testament and the Palestinian Targum to the Pentateuch. And uh, the first edition, well, the, the thesis was defended in 1965. And there was a good American there who had the job of seeing it through the press, the poor unfortunate, because it wasn't the most presentable, I suppose, from what it, he is still alive. He is in St. Louis, and he's an authority. You might know more about him than I do. I don't remember his name at the moment, on the Epistle to the Hebrews. And uh, he saw this through the press, and it was published in 1966. It was published by the Biblical Institute itself, and the agreement was fair enough. It was, they said, our contract will be, you, that is, my society, Missionary Secular, will pay all costs for the production of the first edition, and then we have sales, and when the sales produced the covering of the expenses we have undertaken to publish it, you on your part can get all the royalties until you have covered all your expenses, which was exceptionally fair. And mind you, when that happened, there was a fair amount that came in. And the thing, believe it or not, they ran and, and, and made it quite a bit of profit. Then there was another printing, which is this. It's the New East Discussant, second edition, which is a supplement containing additions and corrections. In Rome, 19-something-thing-eight, but sometime later there, that was published 
to the second printing. And that second printing ran out as well, and nobody did a print. This was 1978. So that was that. Now that was that time. And uh, it happened at a time when the whole scene was changing drastically. There was uh, coming into being, you had Comrade, you had, of course, the Targums were in Aramaic. The thinking at that time would be Jesus spoke Aramaic. Here we have texts in Aramaic. We presume they're contemporary with Jesus, and you couldn't have better works. But then there came in a new age in the stages of the Aramaic language. And of course, there was one genius coming in there, and Joseph Fitzmaier, and there were others as well, but his his view in generally for the stages of the Aramaic language was generally accepted. The Arameans were a group that happened over the 12th century. They formed petty estates around the place. One major one was Damascus, but there were others. And uh, they had their language. And uh, they had also writings. Joseph Fitzmaier himself pre uh, presented one contract or of a sim from Smyre. That would be old Aramaic, maybe from the 9th or 8th century BC. And he published that. That was old Aramaic. Then, of course, Aramaic developed. And in due time, it went into Ill Ill Middle Aramaic. And it, you, you had the Aramaic of the Book of Daniel and the Book of Ezra. And then you had the Aramaic, you had the Aramaic, the Aramaic of letters from Egypt to Jerusalem. And then you came the Qumran Aramaic which could be dated as well, older Aramaic and present Aramaic. But from that it was quite clear that the Aramaic of the Targums was not the Aramaic of the first century. And by later dating, you had, of course, Christian Palestinian Aramaic as well, written in Syriac script, and as the Aramaic of Onkelos might conceivably, the Targum of Onkelos, official Jewish Aramaic. That might be a language of the first century. There wouldn't be much use for people for uh, with paraphrase, but the Aramaic of the Palestinian Targums is Palestinian Jewish Aramaic, which is quite distinct in a certain items from Qumran Aramaic, maybe third or fourth century. So that's the first thing there. Then that would say the Targums are less relevant. And there's an interesting episode, though the uh, Sean Frame was present at the defense of the thesis, a big man that was studying the text in question, the Lord is the Spirit, was Father Prim. I think he had written a big book in, uh, in German on the subject, and he was listening to it, and uh, he had called for a cheer at my thesis that the problem was now solved. And it so happened to about a quarter to five and the bells, the Angelus bells in Rome were ringing, <laughs> were ringing. And he said, problem is solved and even the Angelus bells are, 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 are out <laughs> and proclaiming it. <laughs> well, there was never any attention whatever paid to that because the text in question was taken from an Elgate Targum. That's how I got into that. But anyhow, the uh, Aramaic of, 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 of Qumran went on. I went on publishing that. I had written a lot, as you see, in my, in my bibliography in later times of written various letters on the Aramaic. I, my argument was, of course, that Qumran Aramaic is written Aramaic. There is also a, there is also a, uh, a spoken language which need not be necessarily represented by the written Aramaic. There are some cases that when, for instance, Tanita Kum, which in Aramaic it would be Tanita Kumi, in Syriac it would be written Tanita Kumi, but which would punctuate Tanita Kum, and uh, that uh, the, 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 the Targums would have Kum, or the Christ Aramaic would have the Kum, pronounced Tanita is a word not found in Palestinian or in, in Qumran Aramaic. It is found in one of the Targums, the Palestinian Targums. And you'll get on from that. I'll continue from that. 
Then, the next step, I suppose, the two things now, the Targums and the New Testament is one thing, which is very strongly opposed by uh, the Fitz, uh, Joe Fitzmaier. But there's two things. The old Targums also are part of Jewish literature, and they have a value in their own right. And the next thing, possibly the next thing, was that I'd like to get them published. Not all of them. <clears throat> I'd like to get Genesis anyhow. Because I think we ha I have <clears throat> a colleague in, in, in Spain, Peter Macho, who was a specialist in Aramaic at that time. And it was, he was publishing Pong Colossus. And he was also looking for the manuscripts of Pong Colossus. So he was looking around the world for all the manuscripts. And he got one from the Vatican. And then well, he didn't get it itself, but he got his catalogue with the opening words. And he said, This work catalogue is Ankaros. It's not Ankaros, by the way, is the official Aramaic Targum, the one used by the Jews. The other ones would be free. They would probably be used, but not in the official Aramaic, official Jewish synagogue. He said, this is not Onkelos. And these opening words, as far as I can see, are the opening words of another Targum we know, which is the Palestinian Targum. And it might be that we, we have here in this manuscript a text of the lost Palestinian Targum. So there was a colleague of mine in Rome, of course, a Roman dean, uh, you know, um, and then the uh, Dias Maria and Arias Arias, Arias, yeah, Arias. And the Ed Matthew asked him, Would you ever go to the Vatican and to get a photograph of this manuscript? Which he did. And uh, the Ed Matthew said, We have found the whole entire Aramaic Palestinian Targum. And it was in a collection of pious house Pia Domus Neophytorum, the pious house of the Neophyte. Now the Neophyte didn't strike me as something bad that time, you see. It was just a name. The Neophyte would be the name given to converts from Judaism to Christianity in Rome, and they had a house for their own safety, I suppose. But this was number one in that collection. So it came under Tiago Neophyte. And uh, Yet Macho, since we are the same group, in that Macho had been very, very helpful to the Irish province and he gave us a number of books and he got us Michael Marr and myself, who also went on the same course of uh, Hebrew and Aramaic as myself, he got us involved. Now he had two things to do. He had first of all a critical edition of Neopoly, which he wanted edited together with a Spanish, a French, and an English translation, and he got Michael Marr and myself to do the English translation. Then there was another thing, we had a critical edition of the Palestinian Targum that I gave you, we had that whole set, and they came out later, so that got us involved in that. I couldn't, don't, I don't know the, uh, the, 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 the actual dates for that, but to see the relevant up to the 1980s or so. Now, they had the next thing now would bring us back to the Royal Irish Academy. I was uh, elected as a member there in 1981. And within it there, thanks to an ex-professor of an Englishman, an ex-professor of Greek, uh, Huxley, George Huxley, who was very keen on having a, a Mid-Eastern subject or, or a kind of, a kind of element within the head and he succeeded and we were in that there was Sean Frain, John Bartlett and myself from the mothers and uh, the thing we had done work there we'd organized a number of conferences the one of them was a very good one I think for the book or something it was a person who got into trouble because he was keeper of books in Hebrew Manuscripts and Chester Beatty Library. 
he put in a page or something out of one of them and he was cut for that and he lost his job. But the next thing, he said in the next conference, we were preparing now, oh yes, it takes me back now before that, to the year 1980. I was teaching in, in Ohio, in, in Ohio 1980 there, John Carroll University. And uh, I was in contact with Michael Glazier already, through, mainly through the works brought out by Wilfred Harrington and others. And uh, I just put it to him, I put it to him, it's a very good idea. I have already published a translation, probably off of the Genesis, to be a good idea, but this could be published somewhere. So he said, uh, Thanksgiving 1980, just up down to me at Wilmington, in a house in Wilmington, and another in, uh, in, in uh, Florida, and we'll chat over it. So I wasn't talking too long, but he said, Yes, I'm all for it, but not just one book, Genesis, for the whole lot of the Terracles, for the whole lot of them, and to be done scientifically, to be translated scientifically, with a critical introduction and critical notes by authorities in the subject. So this was November, I suppose, the end of November, and if you were the end of January, I've got a team together in an editorial board. I want you to be director of it. If you've got an editorial board, and if you submit by the end of January a plan, a publication to me, each of the books, the name, the author, etc., to me, and I'll attend to it. Which I did. I said, Michael Marr, one of the, the editorial board, Michael Marr, one. The other would be professor of. Semitic languages in UCD, Kevin Catcalf. So we got that together, and he said, fine, go right ahead. Now I want the first one to be in soon. So we got started, we got the team, and we named them all. And mind you, from the original beginning to the end, they were all there except one, who was a bit slow in presenting anything. But uh, he left England and went to Australia. I don't think he's been heard of since. But any of all that they were the same. We had about four from Belfast and we had four from Dublin. The four from Belfast were really top notchers in the field. Two of them were working in England. One of them was a professor in Cambridge and the other was a professor I think in Oxford. And we had two of them from Belfast. And then we had the others from Dublin were Michael Marr and myself in Catcliffe and Sally Melvin and we got to work. We were working away. I was supposed to be director, I was. Things were going well. I was slow myself because it's all very well to say. He wanted in an hurry. And one thing about him, Michael Glazier, as they sing from Clark or Brim. Brim, is they wanted things by deadlines. And in some authorities, let's say for the, prof the specialist in the canting of planting ups. He was a specialist and he's written a lot, but he was a team that won't produce in a hurry. And what would you do to present to lose him? So around uh, those crisis reading, around uh, uh, arriving, at a certain time, Michael Glazier, who was an uh, he was an Amsterdam smoker, I was suffering from emphysema anyhow, and he was worried whether this project could continue because the stuff wasn't coming in. And he said, you're director of this, you must realise that it's no easy project. To produce one of those works, I have to bring in special typesetters. And there's no bringing on a, a, a group of special typesetters for one now and another book in a year's time. And it comes to a time whether you succeed in giving me the books in or I will simply have to scrap the whole project. Together with that, Michael Glazier's secretary got hold of his money and paid it into her own account. So that was a double first. Anyhow, I was told he, he contacted 
liturgical press and they succeeded. They agreed to take over the project. Actually, liturgical press taught me later. Actually, he had contacted us before that. <laughs> before that person. Took, so they took over. And anyhow, I had the job then of doing what? I had to see that the moved ahead either to the satisfaction of Michael Vege or to the press and to reorganise and to get new people to do it. And I was fortunate to get the man from Durham, the uh, Robert Hayward. He helped me out with the offering and other things. And then God brought another one in, Clark, who was already a big man. He already came in. So that got things going. And although it was supposed to be finished in 1990 or so, it wasn't finished with uh, the Cantigan of Cantigans, which is an excellent work, all about 2009. So that was that. Now that was done. And it was then in the, uh, in the, well, going back to the academy, we had this meeting and we planned a conference on the Aramaic Bible and its, the Aramaic Bible and its background, Targums in their historical setting, and edited by D.R. Beatty and M.J. McNamara. Beatty was one of those editors from, uh, from Belfast. So we had that, and uh, what we had there in that was there weren't too many there, but they're all permitted people, including Ernest Clark. And we had three things. I remember at the end of it, saying that I'm happy for three things. First, that we don't have this conference at all. Secondly, that we have a, a, an idea of going ahead. Thirdly, that we have agreed to found a society of, of, of the Jalbogi studies and Ernest Clark was elected as the first thing. His job would be to try to get it linked to some other group. He had tried to get it linked with to, to the Old Testament society one time but no good. So he asked him to try again. He tried again and he succeeded and we had the first meeting of the Targum Society, I think in 1995. That was that. That went on from there. Now that's the Targums. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, well, that, that was done. I don't think that I had any major thing on the Targums apart from that. And then your book Targum and Testament was republished later on, wasn't oh, it? Well, the Targum and Testament I didn't bring in. Targum and Testament I have no sign in my other room. Targum and Testament was published by a group based in Shannon and I got a copy of my work from Shannon. It had to come into the Republic of Ireland, <laughs> that's the cost customs, I think I had to be taxed it. <laughs> but that, and then, that, had to, that was the only thing on Targums that was available and that was published, I don't know which, what year was it published now, and uh, we have it here somewhere. 72, I think, was it? Mm -hmm. 72? 72. Yeah. As early, as early as that. And then there was a reprint much later. Yes, yes. 72, yes. that's fine. Yeah. So it was the only thing there was on it, and it was considered good. It was early. It was first of all introduction to the Tarragons, and then you had introduction to each individual Targum. Now, at a given time, Eardmans in uh, America, the, the city there, we have three or four different publishing houses, they contacted me, they were prepared to give a new edition of your Targum and Testament, because, or a reprint, I think they wanted, of Targum and Testament. Oh, I said, a reprint, no. Things have advanced too much to reprint it. I'll be out a new edition. And I'm a slow worker. They kept printing me on. I finally printed the new edition. Targum and Testament revisited. I was most unfortunate in my delay. 
because it's a, it's a very good work. I mean, the, but there was another one there. You see, one thing I knew from Kalamazoo and the meetings of the International Terracum Society of meeting the specialists in the field, and one was Plusser. He's Iowa, he's professor there. I think that's his name. And he and another one who has written a lot on the Targums and the New Testament, that his name is now, he'd be an Englishman, he's a, they produced a new book called simply Targum. It came a little after mine, and, uh, but actually it overshadowed mine because his name, and also it was much more practical because he had together with his specialists in the Targum and New Testament. And it's a good book. But that's that. And the two of them are going. There aren't too many copies, I think. I'm getting yearly account. But there are not too much copies of Targum and Testament revisited that are so. But it's still going. It's still going. And that's about the Targum. Then I finished. I, I, was, I was asked to go to... Kalamazoo. I was going to Kal Kalamazoo was the medieval conference of Kalamazoo at, uh, at Kalamazoo. One time we were presenting with Little Madge and they were saying there is a place called Kalamazoo as if nobody ever heard of it. So it's a huge conference, there might be 12,000 there. It's the medieval conference of Kalamazoo that meets yearly in the University Northwest Michigan after the schools have finished. So I went there. Another person who helped a lot, this would be for Kalamazoo, would be on their Latin studies, would, uh, would be uh, Dennis Brearley, who was professor of Greek in Ottawa and very keen on their Latin studies. And he had edited one of the texts of uh, one of the, the grammars of an Irish writer. He also was there, and then he realised that in Kalamazoo, it is hard to get in for a slot unless you have a, a society behind you. So he said the best thing is to found a society, Society for Other No Latin Studies, which he did. And we were going there for a number of years. But uh, I gave it up, I think, we got sick later and died, but uh, he did tremendous work for. I've got no Latin studies in Kalamazoo. There is an Irish society, there is an Irish society for medieval studies in America. And they have a slot in Kalamazoo. And in 1994, 2004 or something, I was asked to give what they call a farewell lecture on the Bible and the Apocrypha in Ireland, which I did. So it is. 1904, 1910, 1910, I think, 2010, I think, the final lecture, which I gave, which was a long one, and there are four parts of it, and they're, they are all published, and this, when they came around here, they published each of these parts as a special one here, in my collected essays, in the collected essays is 2015, I think, but anyhow, after that, I was approached, or maybe 2009 or so, after University Press, that I got I could compose a Targumic dictionary, a Targumic bibliography. I did my best, I thought twice, been coming back from Kalamazoo when I do it, and it came again, I said I'll try. So I did it. And uh, one of the things was, and very little of yourself in it. That's one of the, <laughs> that was one of the points in it. So I got as much as I could. But of course, when it went to their specialists, they said there are a lot of things you have left out. So a person who was much more up to the world of Judaism was Flusser, I think it's Flusser, not Flusser. Flusser. What is his name? Paul Flusser. Flusser, Paul Flusser. Yeah. Paul Flusser. I contacted him. And he would, with uh, Paul Fletcher, brought it up to date. That was 2009.
2010. So that was my end with any contact with Targums. After that, I was totally involved. I've been involved before, but I've done a in studies. And what was your first publication about the Bible in medieval Ireland in Latin? I name Ireland in Latin. Well, the, the, oh, the first publication in my in Ireland in Latin was a paper which I considered a book in 1973. That is, Psalter text and Psalter study in the medieval Irish church. And then you developed that into a book, didn't you? I, 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 I had a lot of writing, but most of my concentration then was on the Psalms in Irish tradition. Because, fortunately, you see, the manuscripts of the Bible in Ireland are few. And the few that are there are dependent on their connection with the liturgy. And one of the things, of course, was the uh, the 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 the, 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 the Psalter. And the next was the 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 the, 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 the New Testament, the, uh, the, the New Testament documents. But anyhow, I went through all that, and uh, I presented it to the academy. I wasn't a member of the academy in '73, until only members could present papers. So Ludwig Dieler presented this on my behalf. So I I did a pretty thorough review of the whole question in Bible. The the title that's giving it to it was the Bible text and Bible study in the medieval Irish Church or the Irish Church, and. I practically cover the whole thing there. And I wouldn't have changed very much now. Sometimes I see I'd see that this particular thing, this particular section, there's one famous manuscript of the Psalter, which is the Rouen Psalter, tenth century. And there are it is oh it is a lovely thing. You see that? They had great devotion both to the Vulgate text and the translation from the Hebrew, the Hebraicum text. Mm -hmm. And they had all that illuminated Psalter, the Hebrew text on one side and the and the Gallic Aram text on the other, and both of them both of them glossed. And the Hebrew text glossed in another book which I'm quite familiar. And uh, another book that I'm quite familiar that it is the uh, the, uh, the 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 um, and the school of Antioch. And one thing about the Psalter text in Ireland, it goes back to the fourth century. So a very literal it, interpretation. Then. It goes back to the school of Antioch. You had the Alexandrian school with the origin, and with emphasis the. Uh, a lot of interpretation. The school of Antioch objected to that. As I said, the Bible is literature. You can't be jumping. You can't be jumping from a historical text to a Christological interpretation. And there was one there who wasn't a genius or anything like that. Theodore of Mopsuestia. He, at the, at the age of only 18, he wrote a commentary on the Psalter. Now, it isn't that it's, it isn't that it's a the never breaking thing, but it's just for the accident of it, brought into Ireland. That's in the east, he did it. In the west, at the same time, the uh, Pelagianism was emerging, if not flourishing. And there was one strong, very literary man, very literary man, that's uh, Julian of Eclanum. Eclanum is a, is a, uh, a city or a place near Naples in the south of Italy. His father was a bishop, he was bishop there. His father was a bishop, a notary, was married. Judy himself was married. But contemporary with him, you had that, we won't call him fanatic, Augustine of Hippo, who was railing against married bishops. And he told, aren't you, aren't you a bishop? Are you jumping in and out of bed with your wife? That's not, nothing proper for a bishop. But anyhow, uh, uh, Julian of Eclanum remained there, and he uh, was emerging there, of course. 
thing which is modern today is don't be all caught in this talk of men born in corruption. A baby is a baby and they're not corrupt. Uh, to be modern thinking as well. But uh, he got into trouble over Pelagianism and the requirement of baptism and uh, the necessity of grace. So he kept at that and in 418 the church drew a line and they said, Julian, old friend, you signed this document denying Pelagianism or your association with it, the doctrine, or you quit your diocese. So he had to quit his diocese and he went east and he was a good friend of Taylor of Oxyestia and he got his, he got his, uh, his commentary in the Psalms and he translated it into Latin and of course it was a good classical Latin because both Theodore and Julian was a classical writer and he translated it into Latin. Now we don't know what transmission that was but it was transmitted anyhow and there's very little we emerged. The only thing that emerged for the greater part is its association with Irish tradition because it so happened that somebody made what was called an epitome of the thing and that was being transmitted and the epitome would have texts of Julian's real translation it would have other texts that had little to do with Julian but it was transmitted anyhow and at a given time it would appear that the epitome existed only in one manuscript and the first part of that manuscript was Ralph's at uh, Psalm 1611 and it was replaced by a full text, a full translation of Julian's translation of Theodore. And now it will appear another thing. There was another form there, apparently an Antiochian commentary. Now it, the thing peculiar to Julian, you see, was that he admitted only four Psalms to 8, 34 and 109 were direct prophecies of Christ. The others weren't. And there was another Antiochian tradition which is known only from another addition that was made to this thing at the beginning of it in another tradition. There was a commentary that didn't admit that any of the Psalms was a direct prophecy of Christ. The Psalms in question would be 2 and 8. They say Psalm 8 is just a hymn in praise of nature. But that would be, now, what dates can we put to those? We don't know. But all we know now is he come down. I, on my own view is that all this happened in Italy and was being, being transmitted in conjunction with Pelagian documents, especially Pelagius's commentary on the Pauline epistles, which are a good commentary and nothing heretical about them. Well, practically nothing heretical about them. But anyhow, as regards any, we have now to come to Ireland where we can date some things. Well, the Milan, the, the, uh, the Rouen commentary is 10th century, so its beginning is in 10th century, so I can compose that much older, but we have commentaries which can date from about 750. Manuscripts can date about 750. And they're written in Ireland, they're not written in Ireland, but they're clearly an Irish. They're, trans, they're preserved in, in, in continental manuscripts and they can be dated about 750. And they have a combination of two things. They have a combination of certain fathers Gregory, Augustine, and some of the others, but they also have a combination of uh, the Antiochian things. And we have, fortunately, one set of those have the uh, Antiochian interpretation of for this of Julian, and from 111 they have the full translation 
and there's another set that have the epitome and for the beginning from 2 6 foot 16 11 we have the other behind your keyboard so we can see the two of those so i think from study we can postulate that that was composed in ireland about the seventh century or so a commentary on the psalms which was Antiochian in the other sense of it, without any other sounds being attributed to the copy of how was Christ. When they put the question of how then do you explain the references to these texts of Psalms in the Gospels? And the answer is they're there because the similarity of circumstances. So they had their answer. But uh, in the, we have then a big commentary. From the, we must remember that there was a union between Ireland and Northumbria around those times. That Christianity in Northumbria came from Iona, came with Aden, 634 or so. And he did tremendous work. The king of Northumbria took him around in his horse and translated from Irish into Northumbrian. And there were three of them there. There was Aidan, another one, and around 664 or so, there was Cormollan. Now things were changing because Gregory, Pope Gregory around 600 or so, he had met English slaves in Rome. And he had made his famous statement, non angry said Angeli. Are not angels but angels, and he agreed to send missionaries to England. They came to the south, Canterbury. All right, that's fine. It so happened that one of the kings of Northumbria, of the Celtic Church, married a queen of the Roman Church from Canterbury, and then there rose over Easter, and that led to a terrible row that led to so we have to do something about it. We can't have just the celebrations of these antiquated Celts. So they had a big meeting of a place called Whitby. They generally we say a council of Whitby. The modern authors they say we say a council of Whitby, but we have to put another thing before it, another name, because Whitby only came into existence later. The place was the same. So the sign was there, and a lot of things, and of course, and signs from heaven. And Peter, of course, carrying the keys. And unless you are obey Peter and the Roman tradition, you have no chance to get into heaven. And I said, That's that. And Cornwall said, If that's that, that's that. We're not going to fight over it. We, Irish, will go back in quietly to Iona. And they did. And a lot of them, Anglo Saxon monks, went with them. They went back to Iona. And in 668, they said, We'll go and have a foundation in Ireland. And they went to Ireland, to Inish Boffin. It's uh, an island off Mayo. They went there. And it would appear that the two nationalities now didn't get on too well. Some would say, that the Irish went out picking potatoes or they didn't too much attention to their religious life. So the English anyhow said, we'll leave them here, we'll go on the mainland and have our own foundation, which they did. In a place that was unnamed, I suppose, when they went there, but became named nothing, no, 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 no uh, racism involved, known as Mayo of the Saxons. We own a Saxon. And they went down and the thing of we own a Saxon. They were there from 668, I suppose, and they developed. And we know just recently from this work here, when I was doing this, when I was doing this, they reminded me there's a, at Alcon's time in 800. And uh, I was reminded that the uh, Question there, you have no mention of the latest biography of Alcuin. 
century but he has doubts about the dating of one that's the debt of somebody and he in his time he's clear he has three letters or two letters I think I know two or three to the monks of we own a Saxon and in that he says shall I meet you so often when your monks come here to York Northumbria now had passed to York they were successors of Northumbria so He's there, and there's apparently that this Anglo-Saxon community in We Own a Saxon, We Own a Saxon, had to make communications with York. They also had a bishop, and presumably a bishop consecrated by the, by the Bishop or Archbishop of York. And that was that. And uh, so, anyhow, that's getting back. We have another commentary can be dated the early 8th century and it's commentaries glosses on the Psalms and half the glosses are from the epitome and half of them are from the lost gloss of the 7th century which has no reference to Christ's prophecy so that Gloss has a lovely, uh, a lovely ending for the colophon, and the person who wrote it has said, "Ego, edel bericht, filius bericht freely, scripsit, hank glossem." I bericht rich and a bericht freelius. I wrote this gloss. Of course, then the 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 name is not Umbrian, not Irish. Also, in his writing. They have what is known as a tur sign, the, the abbreviation of TUR, which is typically Northumbrian. So the question arises was it written in Northumbria or was it written in Ireland? Not, a lot of the scholars had it written in Northumbria, but there was that union between them. My own view is well, probably written in Ireland because I have new evidence that this new non Christological interpretation of the Psalms was known in Northumbria and anyhow since there was so much between Ireland and Northumbria at that time it could be this scholar came across but that's that so th th that is that now the, uh, most of the study is done in that but uh, where the, the, the that of the 800 we have glass psalters the glass psalter of the 18th century the uh, latest bit of the, of, the, of the Antiochian tradition in Ireland is found as it should be in County Clare. Tell us more. Mm. Tell us more. <laughs> no, it, uh, the, there is in the island of Scatter. And there is, and there is a, what you call lake there. Loch Derg. There's a Loch Derg on the of Garethlone. But this island, Loch Derg, and in Loch Derg, there was a monastery that goes back to Cameen. And uh, I've, I've been studying that quite a bit. And what we have there were remnants of a glossed psalter from the 11th or 12th century. It is only a remnants of Psalm 118. The original thing from which you think was probably copied or transcribed a little bit further north in uh, in the major monastery there in, in, in the Shannon but uh, there we have the tradition of uh, we have the tradition of um, the, the Psalms they still have emphasis on the literal translation and they have some of the epitome and there we have the latest text of the epitome. And it's curious, you know, 
in Irish tradition, they respected the Abraikum very much. And if we're talking about the Abraikum, there were two things. There was a, a specific English or Irish recension of the Vulgate, which we have in the Cork, 7th century, and a specific tradition of the Abraikum. So the Abraikum was probably known in Ireland and may have this specific tradition may have been formed in Ireland in the 7th century. But anyhow, in the uh, in the uh, in Ishkaltra, that's the island there, and the, and the Irish there, you have this remnant of a psalter, and on the top, you have in the centre, which is very well described by Pauline O'Neill, all the different shades of writing, their size and their form, depends on where they are. But in the centre, you have the biggest text. It's the vulgar in the center of it, just to the left and to the right and between the lines. And on the top margin, you have the Abraikum corresponding to the vulgar of the text. But of course, you couldn't have the full Abraikum on the top margin. So, on they give you a lot of the times, it's the first letter of a Abraikum word. So, that's that. Now, I've written an article on that. I've mentioned it there, I think. One of my forthcoming things in the other Clare. I've written an article on that. A very nice article. Very, very, but it's, it's, it's on that document. It's uh, headed or subheaded from inter examination, interpretation from Antioch on the Orontes to Doctor on the Shannon, right. and it should be out. I already have it. Uh, I have the copy of it, and uh, it should be. It's this year's. Probably out already on the other Clare. That's about that part of that. And then um, you also published a collection of essays, including one by Bernard Bischoff, which was very significant. Do you want oh, to say well, about the beginning, that? actually, I had. Now it's interesting that uh, the great scholar of uh, some people who dismiss him of being antiquated, uh, John Ryan. He has a big book on Irish monasticism. And uh, in Rome, probably my second year in, uh, in, in Biblical Studies, we had there, John Ryan was at the Gregorian. He would go regularly there, not him, and so often. He was giving talks there on Irish monasticism. So I took occasion of the meeting to put the question I put to myself, if there was all that talk about the Bible in Ireland, what have we got to show for it? Mm -hmm. And just curious, this would be about, I finished the second year, my, my, my second year of the Biblical would be 1956. And curiously enough, he said, yes, that is true. However, just recently, now he went up to it, a German professor has written an article showing that there was much more. That was my first contact with Bernard Bishop. Mm -hmm. So he said that time, and the, the Jesuits are great for cataloging or keeping track of the uh, works and talks of their members. Mm -hmm. So I asked the German and the man in charge of there, would they have anything there on that from that time? So he gave me, it was catalogued, I think. That was the catalogue they went to an institute. It was an essay presented to Aubrey Quinn by Bernard Bishop. Mm -hmm on his publications. Mm -hmm. So that was that. Now, the question comes in there, I've seen there, you see, since 56, mm -hmm. something about it. One of our men was cycling around, or motor cycling around in Germany, Colombo Grady, and he had an accident, 
and he had a long stay in a hospital, at which time he picked up German. Mm. He was quite good at German. So I asked him, would you ever be able to translate this into English? Which he did, fortunately. Mm. And we had that there. I was dabbling around for it for years. Then, in 1966, after the council, the Irish Bishop did two things. They founded an Irish Theological Association. And then after that, they founded an Irish they founded an Irish Biblical Association under the name the Catholic Biblical Association of Ireland. And we went under that for a few years. Until the first uh, president of that was one senior boy, and of course he was the outstanding Semitic scholar in Ireland. So the, uh, the substitutes were Wilfred Harrington, who was automat not automatically, but was the second president. In 1972, there would be time for another president because Dermot Ryan had just been nominated as Archbishop of Dublin. So the question arose, who would we have as president? I was burst of the association, so they asked me to stand for president. And I became president in 72. And then, I think, now the, uh, the publications, the, the the, uh, the, uh, the then got interested in this, and I was just interested in doing something about doing something about doing the bishops to have it published or to begin anyhow something about the modern era. So we got various things, and we called together, curious enough, with small funds. We said we'll have in 1976. We'll have a conference on the Bible in Ireland, because some writers were not that were interested in it. One of the Bi Bernard Bishops, one of the things they know after was uh, Robert McNally, who was professor of, of uh, history in Fordham University. And instead of doing, I think, general church history, he spent a lot of his time in Irish history. And he did quite a lot for the Bible in Ireland. He studied under Bishop, and one of his students was a Joe Kelly, who was professor at John Carroll University. So we invited him along. We probably had enough money to pay his way, and that we had the audacity to call it to name it as an international conference. So the question arose then: What would we do? I think those should be published. So we agreed should be published and it down um, anything like a volume to make one issue. So we said we published a translation of Bishop's Glenda Punta together with the SS from this conference and that was published in 76 or 77. Depends on which page, which of the, of the cover you do. <laughs> so that began. Now going on from there we kept thinking of it. And in 1984, we did more, we did more, more thinking on it. And uh, we said, if we want to go anywhere with publishing the material of Bishop or others, the Bible in Ireland, we need money. And if we need money, the uh, subscriptions or the, or the fee won't be enough. So we decided to have an appeal. So we had an appeal, we sent out a lot of letters to bishops and others. The bishops were very generous, but uh, the person I had seen, I had been in Rome for some reason or other. I had to be in Rome in 85, and Wilfred Harrington had to attend to more of the letters going in, among other things. So we ended up with about 13,000. And now the question. We already had met an understanding with, well, accidentally actually, by some reason or other, some error was made. I was made a member of a, an, the, an Irish, the Royal Irish Academy Association in Classics or something. And I put before him a project 
or publishing Irish material. And they said, fine, we'll work on it. And the, uh, the uh, association, the Royal Academy, which was around the Quintony Harvey, that was with our purpose because they had going there a dictionary or uh, a lexicon of Irish identity. So we agreed that, but said we have to have the money for it. So with the 13,000, a big band there, the 13,000 would be in that, would be David Howlett. David Howlett was a big man for the uh, English, Latin, Latin from English sources in Oxford. So I remember meeting him in 85 with this sign that we had this amount of money. And he said to the academy, with 13,000, I think we can start. Now, the uh, Corpus Christi and Norman and Brockers must have got warned or something that we were doing this. And one fine day, we got a letter from them, from one of their elected people, Bruno van der Platza saying, I understand that you're beginning to try and publish the material in Latin yourselves. Isn't it a pity now that we'll be using all your money for that? Why don't you join with us? And all that can be done without any charge to you. And with that, the project became united with Corpus Christi and all, and it went on from there. It's a totally guilty each day. Academy. I'll just say more about the series. I think it's just a volume here. No, that's another thing. That's the other one. No, that left us with another thing, the Irish Apocrypha. I, I was in our house in Galway this day. I was chatting about it. I was bringing down titles of Apocrypha from Irish writings. And uh, I know I think I met the I think the professor was out talking about it. I think it's Gerard Mochon, as far as I know, he does remember saying to me, he said, why don't you write that up and make the modern titles? Make a description of all and make a book out of it. These were retellings of a biblical story and sometimes with... They are. The Apocrypha is a text relating to a biblical person, but not in the canon. Mm. And it can be... And this is largely New Testament? About all the New Testament. Yeah. Actually, there's very little Old Testament in Irish things. Mm -hmm. The very big one, of course, you have. You have a very big one in Irish language, which is being edited. It's, it's all edited, sort of thing. And it is, uh, it is, what's the name of it now? Most of it is being published in this series might be out now because the last series of this it hasn't come to me yet it's Katrina Katrina Doherty from UCC it's the I forget the name of the, 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 the thing now but that was it but anyhow I did that and having done it together I uh, submitted it I had also a preface to it saying that this is a big project and it has to be properly organised with an editorial team behind it, I said that in the beginning. And uh, anyhow, I sent it in, the Academy accepted, the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies accepted it. That was in, they changed the, they changed the uh, director there. There was just a new director coming in, Green O'Queen, who was terribly interested in this. And he was not only interested in this, the one before him, let my text go through, but not very no queen. He went through every line mm. and corrected here and that and there. He was terribly interested in it. And it finally got published in 1985. Was it 19? Or 75. And uh, there. And uh, then the next thing we made an agreement with uh, the Corpus Christi and Order to publish it there. And Breen O'Queen was delighted because he said, there's where it deserves to be. 
the meaning of an armpit, international things, and let them be judged by international standards. And that has been great. And this here, the first one to be tackled, was the uh, infancy narrative, of which there's a lot of texts. They go under in part on Bahamwera, the life of Mary, which is very well attested in Irish. And it's interesting to see that this is from the Latin. So we had that. The, there was a text made of that. There are different manuscripts. One manuscript that had it was what we call the Liber Flavus Ferguseorum. In Irish, the title is Latin, but the text is Irish. And Madonna of of Diarmid of Monarch, the Diarmid, uh, what do you call him, the, the great Jesuit scholar, he had made a transcription of it already. He's a specialist in it. And he had made it and he presented it. And uh, then we had a team of specialists. Polypo Phoenix that was on it. It took a long time to begin, and we had some failures. But finally, we got organised. And then you also did the Irish Biblical Apocrypha with Maura Habert as well. Oh, that was later. That was later. That was later. Well, of course, a gift there was. Maura is excellent, a specialist in all Irish, and has a tremendous facility to translate. That's a much later work. But in this, anyhow, it just shows you what's involved, what's involved in these two, and what specialists have to do when they're working at the high level of this. Dear Madam God Mason, I'm not maybe, it is not a uh, memory fair, but he was well known, he was well known as Jesuit there, and he had translated that, so he gave it. Then, when it goes into another editor, he says, yeah, that's not precisely done. And of course, when I went to, we had, in this, you had in France and Paris, at the Sorbonne, you had a specialist in that. That's Pierre-Yves, uh, Pierre-Yves uh, something, and uh, he was there. Now, just shows you, important of specialists and it begins Jacob walk something walk on alone James the son of things King he was educated with her and Pierre Yves uh, said that's not a translation at all proper translation that should be James the son of something else, says he wrote this. So, and uh, it went there, Polico Phoenix uh, did his thing, and when it went into a hand of another one, they said, this isn't critically done at all. So, there, when you go into that, you have the specialists in the thing, you have to face other specialists who are, who have no scruple, and it was finally produced. But the value of this thing, and it's an excellent production, because in the crowd there, it was only just a new thing, this, you see, they began, I contacted them about 86, I think they were only founded in 86, in Lausanne, and they were just founded as a small thing for the, for the uh, European, Evangelical group, Paris and Lausanne, and they were there. They were very, very good and very helpful. But when it came to actual text going through it, that I did a lot of notes for that text, and particularly John Daniel Casey, his professor at uh, Lausanne, and he was telling me he was terribly well of course in it and extremely interested in it. He was delighted with the, with the result because it's any amount of things like that. You see, there are certain things you have. The number of the whole, the number of innocents killed gives a whole thing. 119 or it is. Or the smuggling to with all the legs. A lot of things come in like that. And of course, with regard to the Magi, we think that 
I think of three major Irish tradition are quite clear that the three major is only just that they said the major I say in there weren't three there was a whole band of them and then in order to put the two together and the three leading men in that were those of Melchior and St. Bernadette so that's that but it, that was the first volume there were two parts to it and there was so much in it that there was a second volume necessary for the infancy narratives and then the plan was there to produce all the uh, we had our team together going through the material and uh, the idea was to present all the Irish of Ophelbana. Now we are in this team we presented all the texts that are in my, in my book the Irish of the Holy Irish Church they say this is folklore but it's not a folklore so there were a number of them put out that they weren't strictly a folklore by their, their definition of a folklore and their, doesn't, their definition wasn't just arbitrary but they finally came down to the things there was in the infancy narratives you have that you have the magi and you have the other ones two volumes well volume one but in two parts the second part would be the public life of Jesus was it and that would be in three parts or so big the first part was by a specialist in the field who had done a lot of work already the ever new tongue the ever new tongue is Philip the evangelist because when he was killed he kept on talking and I remember giving a talk on that in the early days before we had any organisation to a patristic conference in Oxford and when I had said that the person in the chair said yes he must be a typical Irishman with the gift of the gad <laughs> <laughs> that, was his, that was his contribution <laughs> but John Carey John Carey is an exceptional person he is, he is now head of the apocryphal group but he's very well trained languages I think he's, he's American he's married to a German he's living in living in London but he has a great command he's command of the language and also facility for editing so the second volume had three parts the first was the editor tongue which she alone took part and the second one or oh, the second one then would be apocrypha and eschatology the second one then would be apocryphal texts on this and the third pass would be a eschatological one and the eschatological one from my information the volume has been printed but I haven't received a copy yet it will be seen such things as the 15 signs before doomsday and a number of others a lot of them are in Irish and then the advantage of this organisation is it becomes worldwide one person who is extremely edited uh, learned in this field is Charles Wright in the University of Chicago Illinois and he has written a lot on goes a lot he's a specialist both in Anglo-Saxon Apocrypha and in Irish Apocrypha and he has contributed quite a bit to this so that Irish Apocrypha has become kind of international thing I thought it might be the most interesting. Uh, the, the country with most apocryphal texts would say, No, you didn't hear of the Slavs yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's an awful lot of them in Paleo Slav, an awful lot of apocryphal work. But then again, you see those listening to them. When you go into the apocrypha at this level, you have specialists there in, well, you have, of course, in Greek and Latin, that simple stuff. You have Coptic, you have Armenian, you have Ethiopian, and uh, many others as well. Syriac, and you have specialists in those fields. And some of them will be specialists in all fields. But Little Ireland is far removed from that. And one last question, where do we go from here? Well, one thing I say, where do I go from here? Well, there are two things that I find necessary the Bible in Ireland with bishops saying 
a lot of works in Ireland, clearly Irish, that have been studied. That's another group are doing that. There are two things I think that need study in Ireland. That's the Latin literature in Ireland in the 13th century. And one of those is that is a Bible, which is the entire Bible from the 13th century by the Dominicans. What's that you call it? What would you call the, the is one? It's the Pandect. The Pandect. Well, the Pandect best known is that of Amiatinos, which is only three and a half stone weight, I think. But in the 13th century, you had the Lateran Council, the Fourth Lateran Council. I think Pope Benedict the Third, Pope Innocent the Thirteenth, I think, or the, or the Third. He was very interested. You had the mendicant orders who lived poorly, but were very keen on preaching to the people, and they required. They weren't just in their monasteries. They were out, and they required a work to go with them. That is an entire Bible. For some reason or other, they had got, they had got a new form of thing that they could produce a Bible or a Pandect, the whole Bible that could be portable. And they have hundreds of those from the 13th century in Europe, mainly used by Franciscans and Dominicans. Now, the Irish Franciscans and Dominicans came to Ireland in the 13th, 13th century or so, and they were trained there. So I think they brought a culture with them that isn't documented too well. There is one documented in what we call a pandect from a Dominican house in Arklo. It has the whole Bible there. And it, there is one there I got in contact with when I was writing that about it. I don't mention it on the internet. That's Laura Light. And she let me know all the work she had done in this. There were hundreds of pandects that she has studied. And some of those would have not nearly the Bible, but especially between the Psalter and the book of Proverbs, probably the middle of the Bible where it opened. They could have mass texts, they could have breviaries. And, uh, but the one we have from, from uh, here it came, the uh, Dominicans came to, uh, came to England, I think, before Benedict, uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, Benedict, had, uh, before Dominic had died. And soon after that, they came in about 14 of them or so, to Ireland. And they came to Athlone in 1264. And sometime there, from the 13th century, we have this pandect, which isn't properly studied. I came to it by chance. I was asked to write, there's a Hugh Houghton, who's a specialist in the Latin Bible in the University of Birmingham. He's collected a book for Oxford University Press the book handbook for the Latin Bible and he asked me to do the Latin Bible in Ireland which I could do quite a bit from the pre-Norman theory at 1200 but I said a past reference put down what I could from 1300 only one thing which was this pandic which I took up later and uh, it it's uh, it is a pandic but it has an awful lot of glosses 13th century miniature writing very hard to decipher. It is only when I get somebody to decipher those that we can do more about it. The Dominicans would say that are probably preaching notes for the Dominicans, but there's particularly for sections of Batu to the, the, the losses there that are not setting preaching notes. And the, the apocalypse is highly glossed. Well, that's lots that's interesting. Whatever they do, they had a special interest. That's item number one. And item number two is another thing, and uh, it is an important one. Lou Wadding, the Irish scholar, was very active in Rome in the 17th century, and he did a lot for the annals, he was a Franciscan, for the annals of the Friars Minor. And uh, also wanted to be published in 1624 
the concordances of Antony of Padua. The concordances in the 13th century, not as we know them, they were then were merely texts that could be used for preaching from the Bible or maybe from other texts. But this text, he published with this from one, one text from the library, Franciscan Library of Araceli in Rome. And two thirds of this text, of this concordance, contained another text, which is known as the Promptuarium. Promptuarium is a repository. And the Contuarium, this big work, is definitely Irish. There's no doubt about that. It was written by a Franciscan, composed by a Franciscan. It's in three parts. We know that it's Irish because he mentions the Irish saints, mentions them, quite a number of them, and he mentions one of them, the hand, the procession of the hand of St. Patrick, which uh, they had some procession, nobody else could give me any information of anything about it, never heard of it. But it's a big work, maybe a couple of hundred pages. Now, it's in three parts, and it has a lot of information, and it an contains an awful lot of this unknown author's learning, whether he got it in Ireland or not, whether he composed it in Ireland or not. But uh, the question there is that it deserves to be published, and it's only found in one place. The only text of it is a text published by Luke Waddy in 1624. No other text is known, and probably no other text ever existed, because he published it from a manuscript from Araceli. Now, to be nice to get this manuscript, but those who have gone into it, said it most probably doesn't exist because it was destroyed with the looting of our Italian monastery in 1799. But fortunately, in the last few days, I've been looking around to know where, uh, where Luke Wadding's manuscript will be found, or his book. And I found it in two places, in the Vatican Library. And I was surprised that it's also in the library of the Biblical Institute. So I asked the Biblical Institute if I can have a if I can have a scan of it. So if I can, I'll just see about how it can be published. There'll be no question of editing it, you see, because you can only just reprint it. So there's where I stand to know what we have in the Bible in Ireland in the 13th century. And it's a bigger question. We know there are very little Bible work in Ireland, as far as I know, I have to read. So that's for others to do. And who can take it up from there and go back to the Irish department. Well, thank you very much for your time, uh, Martin. Much appreciated. So many different areas that we've talked mm -hmm. about and that uh, we've learnt about. So thank you very much. God bless. You're welcome. God bless you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I'll clap both of you. <laughs>